So people will start joining now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good morning and welcome to Vic No Till's webinar with Nicole Masters. Uh, it's the first for us in the changing world to do it and it, we found it a good way to get out some content. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the OzGov land care programs for their support, Wimmera Catchment Management Authority and Vic No Till's Platinum Sponsors Hybrid Ag and Lorry Co for their support and being able to put on events like this. Uh, today we have with us agroecologist Nicole Masters and in her own words, an international woman of mystery and soil <laughs> siren uh, and uh, Grant Sims, who, Northern Victorian farmer, cropping cattle and also running a cover crop seed business. Um, I'm Tom Briggs, current board member with Vic No Till, uh, farm in the northeast of Victoria. We run a cropping and sheep operation. Uh, we've been playing around with warm season covers for four years, disc and full star retention for three years, um, have taken out uh, synthetic fertilizers, um, going to a foliar nutrition program uh, and also transitioning to a self-replacing ewe flock to build on the system. Um, so that's a bit about us. Uh, Simsy, would you like to introduce yourself and a bit about what your system is and where you've transitioned to and from over the years? Oh, yep, yep. Um, so yeah, I was, uh, I suppose, been on the board with Vic No Till for the last five years and, and off it now, but um, yeah, we're predominantly cropping, but running uh, cattle as well and, and multi-species. Uh, covers forage crops. Um, I suppose in, uh, I think it was 2008, we, um, we did away with uh, MAP and, and fungicides, insecticides. And um, since then I've been using a foliar um, liquid, uh, sorry, liquid fertilizer, like a biologically made one put together. Um, yeah, and just always learning and evolving. We do a lot of on-farm trials and, and um, to work out a lot of stuff ourselves. Um, yeah, haven't used seed dre or conventional um, seed dressings as well for 10 years. We've got some irrigation country and, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's good. It's interesting to see um, we're still able to grow high yielding crops, you know, with, with water on irrigation without the need for these um, high synthetic inputs and, um, you know, fungicides and insecticides. So, um, yeah, it's take, we've seen, you know, it takes time to, to build your soil and, um, to get things functioning, but I think it's very exciting if, if we can get uh, life back into the soil, biology and nutritional balance, um, you know, what the soil is able to achieve. Um, and we're still not where we want to get to, but mm -hmm. we're always trying to keep improving things. Yeah. Like everyone on a, on a continual curve. Mm. Yep. Yeah. All right. All righto. So Nicole, any sort of out of what Grant and I are doing, any similarities you'd see or like to discuss about what we're currently doing? Um, I think uh, we asked everybody to send in questions. So we've had some really interesting questions and we've got a whole two pages of them. Um, and a lot of those questions are really technical and thinking about um, either nutrient, um, insecticidal, fungicidal interactions with um, either biology and mycorrhizae or plant production. Um, so I think what I'd really like to explore is um, some of the reasoning behind why you do some of the practices that you do. Um, why um, maybe it's been some of the learning and, and some of the um, decisions maybe that with hindsight you might have changed. Um, and I'd like to explore that a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm always on the road. And so, you know, it's always interesting just to see uh, what people are having success with and, and where they are doing the different things that they are doing. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions about seed treatment. I actually think I need to make a video of um, 
you know, making your own biological type seed treatments. Um, so I, I wouldn't mind, you know, like hearing a little bit from you guys about why, you know, why have you pulled the insecticides? What have been the cost or not of doing something like that? Um, so yeah, I wouldn't mind exploring that with you. Yeah, I suppose on um, what we've taken out of the system, one of the, probably one of the easiest has actually been the insecticides. Pulling, pulling them out hasn't been an issue. The only, we've got a bit of an issue at the moment with some long season canola. We've got some army worm going through it. We've had warm conditions and rain and there's just anything that wants to eat, anything's showing up. Um, but other than this moment and trying to get a canola established, insecticides, dropping them out and fungicides has probably been the, actually one of the easiest things to do. The challenge more so has been around crop nutrition um, and also what chemicals you do and don't use around um, herbicides for, for weed control and having weed control has probably been, for us, the biggest sort of learning curve, nutrition and herbicides, what to keep in, what to keep out. Um, yeah, that, that's, and yeah. We've, we've seen periods of high insect pressure um last well, what was it 2018 when crops got frosted everywhere and everyone went and cut their canola for hay and we one of the only canola crops left in the area so we had every single aphid in the district come and hit our canola and it was a tree of aphids walked out there you saw saw beneficials a week later you would have sworn that you'd gone through with an insecticide so it's also a period of yeah. having the stomach and knowing what numbers and thresholds are to not go and put that insecticide out. Um, yeah. But it's also been one where once you know what you're looking for, it's actually been probably one of the easiest things. Mm. Other than establishing okay. canola crops, that's just a continual headache. Yeah, and I think the question is around some of the choice of crops that we, yeah. we plant and we use. And, you know, is this the right growing condition for this crop? There's been a lot of interesting changes in terms of, um, seed selection and what the seed guys are doing and and that a lot of these crops don't have their microbial relationships anymore they say since 1975 wheat isn't even an obligate um, mycorrhizal plant anymore so that's happened through breeding and so what have we done to canola so canola will have biological companions and if we've disrupted that biological community you know those seeds are, are bred for high input systems, lots of insecticides and pesticides, and then we try and put them into a regenerative system. And, you know, when I first started out, I was working in um, the apple industry and working with organic producers and just finding those big conventional, huge production crops just didn't have biological communication really happening. It's like those plants were kind of handicapped and they needed you to kind of feed mm -hmm. them and put all this junk on. And so I wonder if there's an opportunity for regenerative producers to actually be looking at producing seed lines that are plants that have reconnected and I've talked to some seed companies about it and they are starting to have this conversation themselves and I guess Grant now that you've got this business that you're developing um, you know actually having seed that you are producing year on and year on on your place what is the opportunity for that? Yeah that. definitely um, I think and I know talking around some mates sort of I suppose transition and, and change systems and they're seeing you know in the same paddock under the same management different varieties of wheat um, responding or you know or you could say some are sooks and some some will, will adapt to the system so um, yeah I think there's a real uh, place for some of these uh, trials to look at root systems and how they how they can connect and I suppose one of the important things that we work on and, and think about is the the fungi component, it's something that's, I think, sometimes forgotten about because a lot of this, either collaboration or sharing of nutrients or disease protection and all that comes back to fungal associations. And if we're, you know, a lot of these trial sites are doing tillage or fungicides either on the seed or throughout the cropping year, it's hard to get that, that, that sort of um, rolling. Um, yeah. And the other thing, just pointing out on the canola, we see it in the you know, multi-species, we don't, we don't plant any monoculture canola anymore. It's always got a companion. But it always sort of, um, I find interesting that if you go to a paddock where you had canola last year, you get some rain early, you get volunteer canola popping up with no 
seed treatment on it, no fertilizer, no nothing. It always powers away in, into yeah. a you know cabbaging plant and, and seems to grow really well as soon as you buy the seed with the seed dressing on it and put all your you know the right best practice fertilizer under it it's like a beacon we seem to get hammered all the time with uh with or it's the most susceptible probably plant the brassicas to anything and yeah it just always sort of find it interesting the volunteers seem to not have a have an issue as much yeah yeah and i think um I, I read a really interesting um, letter that was written by the USDA talking about those seed treatments and their conclusion was that for every one benefit, there were 99 costs to those seed treatments. And, and the conclusion was, why are we even using these seed treatments? You know, and that's coming from a government level. And it's like the, some of the research around, you know, those neonicotinoids change gene expression in the plant they change 600 genes in the actual plant so you're basically and some of those genes are for um insect resistance and cell wall strength and disease resistance and so i mean it's a great sales pitch you know we're going to put this seed dressing on it's going to do this in the plant and now you're going to need a fungicide um but i think we're handicapping those plants um mm. and i think the sooner we can kind of get some of this stuff out and then really look at um, biological seed treatments, um, so using things like a trichoderma or a mycorrhizae, um, guys are using bacillus, someone, uh, Luke Harrington's was saying he's using molasses and liquid vermicast, um, mm. you know, really setting that plant up for success, um, rather than, okay, we're going to give it a prophylactic, and that actually prophylactic is going to create more problems further down the track. Um, are you guys using seed treatments? <clears throat> Other than the long season canola that we bought this year, we haven't used a seed treatment uh, for three three years. Like we've been putting biologicals on it, and this year we're putting a few more trace elements. But fungicides, no, we've been planting basically bare seed for for three three years. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I meant biological seed treatments. So you, yeah, you are. Using yeah, yeah, this. yeah. Putting a worm vermicast on it. Um, yeah. Yep. No, no compost extract. Yep. We don't, we haven't been doing compost extracts. It's one thing I'd like to get into one day, but it's just, yeah, got other things on the list at the moment, but yeah, worm, worm extract on it. Worm, vermicar, sorry. Yeah. And for you, Grant? Yeah, we've, we've um, yeah, oh, only, you know, if we're buying a new lines of canola comes, you know, already that um, treated with the, conventional one but yeah we haven't used it for i don't know over 10 11 years like yeah on all our other crops um we've been oh, a couple of yeah playing around with lots of different things as seed uh and we're still looking at perfecting you know a, a, a sort of a, a good seed inoculant or brew but um yeah we've done the uh worm casting extracts so that's pretty easy um mm. and then last year we did a lot of uh the pseudomonas bacillus and trichoderma um, and had that like as a live culture and put that on the seed and and that was pretty yeah seemed to work really well we had good sort of the dreadlocks going on the roots and um, mm -hmm. yeah we sort of had low low input as such as uh, nitrogen fossil or you know synthetic forms of that uh, up front yeah. but yeah had canopy closure very quick and yeah so that seemed to be uh, pretty promising mm. Um, I think we could that, that try to Kerma and you, you can um, sort of lift on that, Nicole. Like, you know, the, it's uh, for for disease protection and things on the plant. Getting getting that rhizosphere or the, um, the 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 good biology in there to sort of get all those relationships going and set the plant up to defend itself, rather than you know some of these. I, I talked to one of the barley breeders um, last year, and some of the seeds they're saying you've got to factor in a fungicide. If you're going to run mm. this line, it, it just factor it in as part of the budget. You yeah. know, it's a good yield up, but you, you just, it won't, it won't be able to grow without at least one fungicide. So I think that's a bit of a concern. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a, a, again, a bit of a fallacy in a sales pitch. Um, there's a couple of questions here. And I think we've got questions that we were asked in the last week, but I think it tied, I think it's- Yeah keep that kind of, kind of conversation flowing and I think these questions kind of feed into the questions that yeah. have been so far. So there's a question here about is there a way to increase mycorrhizal interaction with newer bread crops? Um, 
yeah, I think with the newer bread crops, it's quite, it, it is quite fascinating because you look at what is happening with those root systems. And I was trying to find a photograph of, um, I took a photograph of Kamut next to wheat. Um, so Kamut is that um, ancient grain um, that could actually be used as a wheat substitute. I, I, I think I've talked to you about this grant. I'd really like to see people in Australia growing it, uh, Corazon wheat. But anyway, to look at the rooting systems, I mean, they had these massive root systems with all of that Rastafari and all the riser sheath roots that we've been talking about compared to this wheat plant, which had these pathetic little roots and, and the roots were quite clean. And it's like, we've done something in that hybridization of just trying to chase purely yield. I mean, the Kamut itself still yields well, but you know, it's the same with like breeding sheep or whatever, and you're going to select just for reproduction and you lose feet or, or whatever you're doing. But so if, if we buy a new wheat variety or barley variety and at initial purchase, it's come out of an intensive system, can you breed and you, you retain your seed? Can you breed, yeah a mycorrhizal association like a plant that's more like will it will it change that that is that that possible through epigenetic yeah, of retaining the will, seed even though yeah, it might start and, off from a low base yeah and then we're getting into that epigenetics concept yeah. which is that we can change actually I, I had a couple of slides if you don't mind this might be a good time to kind of talk about it um yeah. uh just thinking about what is happening in the seed and how is it that um, we can influence stuff like that. And so if we think about the seed microbiome, so can you see my, my yep. screen? Yep. Yep. Right. So there is actually a seed microbiome, which um, is really new cutting edge research. Like people didn't really think, oh, you mean there's microbiology inside a seed? And it's like, well, yeah, of course there is. And so that, that microbiome comes from either um, vertical, which is, means that it's coming from that mother plant as such, or horizontal, which means it's coming from air and soil and the environment around it. So that if you're thinking of a conventional cropping system with a growing seed, this microbiome from the start is compromised because you're not gonna have that diversity. And what you find is um, some of those organisms that are in those environments, are your pathogens, right? So there's actually diseases that are inside the seed waiting, <laughs> which is a bit of a worry. Wow. And so um, I think, uh, yeah, so this is, this, this is looking at where does the seed microbiome come from? It's coming from within the actual roots and the stem. So there's microbiology that are inside the xylem of the plant or inside like an endophyte living inside plants. And it's part of what plants are doing for nutrition and for health. But, you know, there's this whole world of microbiology that's working away inside plants. And so the seed microbiome, why we want to have um, a diversity of microorganisms is it's going to really help to prime that plant and speed up germination. And here's an image of those Rastafarian roots that Grant was referring to. Um, these microbiology then help to induce that plant defense system. So say you did have sclerotinia or um, rhizoctonia or something, having that seed microbiome already set up enables it to defend itself. It also enables it to solubilize nutrients. So it's helping with nutrient uptake and nitrogen fixation. They are producing plant hormones. So that's going to help with um, rooting length, uh, shoot length, um, and like I said, you can't, there can actually be pathogens in here. One of the processes that's happening, and this is fascinating, is that 30 to 100% of nutrients that the seedling absorbs comes from absorbing bacteria at that root tip. So that very moment that that seedling starts to emerge, it's feeding bacteria around that root zone, and then it's absorbing that bacteria. It blows open the membrane on the outside of that, that bacteria's body and absorbs those nutrients. So it's not having um, a package of phosphate out there or some kind of nutrients. It's actually having microbiology ready to go, stimulated and, and responding to the plant. And the other thing that's quite interesting is that that microbiology that's in that rhizophagy process also is absorbed by the plant and it initiates um, root hairs. So if you have a look and dig up some of your, um, you know, so you've got a new variety, Go and have a look. And what you'll find often is there's not a lot of root hairs and those roots are really, really clean. And it's indicating to you like how much microbiology is really, really functional. 
And so we want to see loads and loads of hairs. So if you look at that image on the left, like the wild type, um, which is a sunflower, we want to see lots and lots of hairs. We want to see soil stuck to it because that's your disease protection. That's where nutrient and water uptake is, is coming in. And so we find this is being reduced through what they're doing with breeding by having not having that microbiology in that seed or around the seed coating. Um, and so we see less disease protection, nutrient and water uptake right from the moment that that plant's starting to germinate. So if I'm thinking about, I'm wanting to encourage mycorrhizae, I want to have all that microbiology, I'm never, ever, ever going to use neonicotinoids on the seed, right? They do disrupt your mycorrhizae. Uh, they do disrupt um, all of that system in the plant. And then what you guys are doing is doing things like coating seeds with compost or vermicast extracts. Again, you want to get some really good quality, um, quality extracts. And uh, there are these commercial biologicals like your trichoderma, your mycorrhizae, um, your azidobacter, like your nitrogen fixes, and actually getting them onto the seed. I do prefer the worm extracts because they have such diversity in them. You're not having to kind of package it and, and guess what's in it. Um, and then either dripping that down the seed, down, down, which I think you're doing, Grant, putting it down when you're planting. Um, we're also putting dried vermicast down the drill in the seed box. Um, and so we want to see, and this is a photo from the Haggerty's in Western Australia, but you want to see that rhizosheath development from the moment that that plant gets out, because the rhizosheath is making a huge difference in terms of um, a buffer to temperature or pH. We're seeing uh, a lot of aluminium problems in Australia um, and in New Zealand on ash soils. If you can have a plant that's germinating and creating that rhizosheath from the minute that it's getting out in the world, it's going to start to be able to protect itself. And that pH can be as much as two units difference. So um, that's kind of a priority for thinking about what are we doing um, in terms of looking after those seeds. So if we've got systems like that, um, and I, you hear a lot of people coming forth with ideas like it's new, this stuff isn't new, right? These ideas of doing seed treatments, like you look at the Korean natural farming. So one of their um, seed treatment mixes, uh, basically, they recommend putting five kilos of a mature compost, mixing that with a bit of molasses and a cup of milk and making a slurry. And it's going to be thick enough to coat the seed, but not so thick that it will pour off. So we're seeing um, Johnson Sioux, so the Johnson Sioux compost, David Johnson. He's talking about taking half a liter of a compost slurry, so that material, mixing it with 10 ki kilos of seed and then adding that into 120 kilos. So the idea of mixing it like that is so you don't get all clumpy and then, then he's drying it. Um, I just think on large scale operations that can be um, really time consuming. So instead actually applying directly to your seed before yeah. you drink. Yeah, so I'll, I'll finish now, but I just, um, I just wanted to share that while people were asking these questions. Um, I'll just uh, add in there, Nicole, on, on some of the just practical stuff, getting these seed inoculants and treatments on. And firstly, also, I suppose, with the breeding of new lines and that, because I don't want to, um, we have NVT wheat variety trials on our farm every year. So we see a lot of new varieties coming out. And I you know, just sort of need a little disclaimer. I think they're doing a great job. Uh, generally a lot of these because I mean some of the new varieties like we used a new variety of barley last year against one of our old that we've retained for years and it, it smashed it in yield in mm. in our system so not all of them are, there's a lot of good work getting done there I suppose uh, as well and that was in yeah. our, you know with, with low input or um, so just sort of putting putting that out there but um, applying the I think some of these seed um, treatments like you've just mentioned there is something we can all do ourselves on farm and you know with with Every type of agriculture at the moment, cost of production is a thing that we've all got to watch. And, and the, some of these things, we can really reduce our input costs and it sets the plan up from a young age so that it doesn't become so dependent on all the other inputs later on, like the, you know, um, fungicides and sectorcides and also help, you know, helping it um, make its own phosphorus and nitrogen available and things like that um, for a, a practical Part of applying, we've gone up to 12 litres per, per ton of um, of whatever liquid, and that's about the max I reckon. And yeah. the grain starts heaping up and getting a bit bit wet. 
um, then we just got to make sure that um, we leave it in the trail. By the time we get it to the truck and into the cedar, it's generally dried out enough that you've got to watch because when you're calibrating, you know, it'll run differently if it's wetter or drier. But a lot of times with five litres a tonne is, um, is pretty easy to put on. Yeah. Know? Do you do you do it up a up an auger or do you have a mixing wagon? We have an old PDO hammer mill that we use that we bypass the hammers into the additives, put a ton in, and then put um, ten liters of product on, and then some dry product in there as well. How, are you doing it up an auger out of a silo or in a mixer? How are you applying it, Grant? Yeah, we <clears throat> we do it up an auger in, because we're doing big, large yeah. um, ton, you know, big bigger. Um, tons I suppose like we might do 10 10 or 15 ton at a time going into the truck because then that'll go out and we'll sow that out in yeah. in, in a 24-hour period so in the mixes is too slow and mucking around when we're trying to do bigger areas but yeah up the auger we drill a couple of holes in the auger and put two nozzles um like a fan you know and just calibrate you have a little 12 volt sprayer so we get a certain amount of liters per minute to and then know how many tons a minute we do and um, yeah, it, it puts it on really, really well. Yeah. So there's a question here about how do you know if a product is good quality? So how, I mean, I know for myself when I used to, when I used to actually have my hands in the ground, um, is that I would do so many different things that it would be hard to pull out and go, well, I know that that was working quite well because I mean, you're doing trace elements, you're doing seed treatments, yeah. biologicals. So how, how do you guys figure out whether or not something's a good product? I suppose part of it's also been the learning, the learning curve. Um, when you're starting to put all different sorts of bits and pieces bits on the piece, pieces. you don't, it's, it's hard to pinpoint one that either adds, does nothing or detracts. Um, so we're using an after or a bought, um, liquid vermi cast off Nutrisoil on the on the seed. Um, believe it to be high quality. Um, and then as far as trace elements, we've just been sort of learning about what's been showing up in tissue tests, our own observations. Um, so not making our own, but buying buying off the shelf products and putting putting on the seed. But that's just been the learning curve of we think we need to add this in, or I don't think that did did anything for us so when you're starting to get multiples it's it did how many trials can you have in one one paddock of trying this against this against this so some of it's just the learning curve of what we think is needed or hasn't done done or provided any benefit for you grant um yeah, that's a, a good question, I suppose, because it's it is tricky when you when you got a whole um, you know looking at a system, it, it's hard to narrow down one one uh, one thing or one input, um, and and sometimes some of these things might take um, time, like it might be a couple of years to to start to build build these things in. Um, there's certain products you can you know foliar apply or put in and and see you know. Um, whether you've got some sort of response. Um, I think, you know, it's always important to leave. And a lot of times when you're in the, the heat of sowing, you just do the whole paddock and it's just easy. But, you know, leaving test strips is very good because that's, you know, you've got to be able to have something to quantify or measure. Um, you know, the bricks, uh, that's probably a simple, easy one. You know, you can spray some of these things on, you know, test the plant for bricks and then spray it on, test it, you know, an hour later or two, and, and at the end of the day, if we're getting a, a really positive lift in the bricks, well, that's good. Um, yeah. So there's a few simple things we can do, uh, you know, in, in the field on the run to, to check some of these things. Yeah. yeah we had an interesting um, scenario last season, I think. We, um, we put on too much worm liquid. So the, the bricks in the lucerne went from 13 to 10 and stayed 13 in the control um, but a week later it was up at 20 so it was like i think we just overloaded the system so I, I think it's worth testing it within 40 minutes if you're trialing some of these different things like the different fish or people are asking um, and then 
te yeah, test it within 40 minutes and then come back a week later and just see actually am I putting too much on and, and just see because some of these um, inputs we're finding there's a suppression if you're going too high and that could be a suppression at half a liter um, and so you need to figure that out um, yeah at what point is that sweet spot of we don't want to actually yeah. shut systems down because especially like I think you guys get your system starting to really really work for you um, it doesn't want you to keep fiddling and adding stuff in yeah which is I suppose where the t the plant tissue uh, the tissue testing or sap testing plays a part in not actually getting a response from the plant seeing what it's actually needing and rather than gut feel I've just got to put something on yeah plays a big part not overloading it one way or the other but still it's you go and get a sap test or tissue test and then you talk to someone, how much of this should I put on? Oh, we don't know. We've never, <laughs> we've never done anything like this before. So you've got to sort of feel it out yourself as well as to what you think is an appropriate amount and, and action to take. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think it's helpful if you're working alongside these companies, if they are doing some of that um, testing in the field. They, they have actually got some trial results. Um, we saw interesting stuff in New Zealand with mycorrhizae with, seven of the leading mycorrhizal providers who were selling um they got tested and none of them were viable like these are the seven biggest companies and none of those mycorrhizal products were viable so asking for viability tests when you're dealing with microbiology um and testing for yourself um, just notice there's a few questions coming in on that how do you tell if a product's good or not do, is that a way to get them to send you an analysis pre they should be able to supply an, an analysis pre pre sale of their product. Yeah, definitely. I'll be uh, especially around biologicals to ask for that activity. Um, just seeing some companies kind of sneak sneaky little things in, like they might be putting hormones in to get a growth response. And um, the only way you're going to figure that out is is to do that for yourself because um, yeah. hormones will drop the bricks. Um, and if your calcium is low, like you know, below 60%, you'll see that with the use of hormonal products, your calcium starts to like disappear quite fast, we see. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, I do think using the refractometer can be one of your better tools, plus doing your leaf tissue test and digging holes. Um, um, someone's asked about ways to increase mycorrhizal interactions. I think um, you want to figure out why is mycorrhizae not working as well as it should. So really using your diagnostics, is it something that you're doing? Um, maybe it is something to do with breeding. Uh, are you adding on too much phosphate? And this is a question, I think, Tom, that you might have printed out from yesterday. Is like, at what point do we see mycorrhizae shut down? So yeah. mycorrhizae really, you know, the plants like feeding, feeding it in, in return for you know, the phosphorus and zinc and other nutrients. And if it gets, um, if you have rapidly available soluble P, the plant is not going to invest in that mycorrhizae. Um, and, and that level is going to depend on the type of phosphate. So how rapidly available it is and on your soil types and on temperature and all sorts of things. So you need to do this testing for yourself and, um, uh, you know, and looking at colonization in that early phase, you know, when plants are like three weeks old, send off the mycorrhizal test and see, you know, what percentage colonization have you got and try and use your diagnostics before I'd be reaching for a packaged product necessarily. What were you gonna say, Grant? Uh, oh, no, I was just, um, there's one uh, question there also, like with the mycorrhizae linking up, you know, what levels, you know, if we are applying some of these synthetic um, phosphorus and um, DAP and urea and, and things like that, MAP, um, as yeah. to what point, you know, the question here is, is what point, uh, how high before it starts doing damage um, to that? Um, and then I, I suppose another thing that we've been told is applying the carbon or the humate to it to help buffer that. So if you want to elaborate right. on that, what, what levels become detrimental, I suppose. Yeah. Um, we know that 50 kilos of MAP by itself is going to shut that mycorrhizae down. Um, when you look at the research, they talk about parts per million in terms of soluble availability, and that's really hard for you to figure that out because it's going to depend on soil types and stuff, and that's where it comes to probably testing your own mycorrhizae. Um, but I think certainly less is more in this case, and then looking at 
how do you increase the efficacy? So it could be your, your mates, so it could be your fish hydrolysates. So those fish hydrolysates they make with a phosphoric acid, and then you've got all this carbon with it. Um, some work done by New Zealand researchers showed that one unit of P in fish gave the equivalent increase in dry matter and phosphate response in the plant to 180 units of superphosphate. So one unit to 180 units. So we're not talking like for like. Um, and so trying to figure that out for yourself is yeah. where, where yeah. do we see that cut off? Was that, was that fish, was that applied on seed or foliar? Um, yeah, you can do a soil drench, you can do it foliar, yeah. you can let me put it down. It has a pH of 3.5, so you're going to be diluting it and, yeah, put it in with you. Yeah, put it in we, with you. Um, we inject, liquid inject um, fish and humates into the soil as a food source, and it's a, you know, a really good fungi food source. I um, find yeah. that very, very good. And I suppose last year was interesting. We, we, um, we were sowing and, and ran out of... Uh, we were using some guano last year and, and um, some of our biological liquid fertilizers and and it didn't come on the weekend so we just went into town and got some map and just kept going and it was interesting to see i think we've got to get used to visually looking like the crops you know we had way more early vigor um you know more biomass through the winter with the map and i was thinking geez what are we <laughs> we're missing out here but then as we got into the spring the map all just shut down and went yellow, you know, started turning. We had a lot more disease in it. It was coming in like um, leaf disease and things like that. And that where we'd done the more biological things, they just kept green, kept going and kept kept going. Um, and in the end, I think the yield was exactly the same, but we were still in the game a lot longer with the other ones. We didn't get a late rain, but if we had of, the plant's still green, ready to, to, you know, we're still in the game. So I think, you know, talking about... Um, map and how quick it you know it's really good early you get everything a flush of it so you get way more early vigor and biomass early but then it can potentially lock up and you run out at the end i don't know mm. if you want to comment on any of that Nicole. yeah well no i think that's exactly what we see in the field is that um it locks up any of those soluble forms are going to lock up really fast and they're also suppressing the organisms that are you want working for you to help release that phosphorus so really the aim of the game is how do you get those guys working for you um, instead of trying to drip feed stuff all the time, you know, and that's where your leaf tests come in and go, do I have adequate phosphorus? Do I need to really be pushing this? And I, I really like the idea of putting fish down with the seed and using that as your early, you know, cooler season um, phosphorus bump. <clears throat> what about um, like we're finding, you know, companions, multi-species, things like that, like clovers, that have found their root exudates can break the calcium phosphorus bond in the soil and things like that, you know, buckwheat, other plants that can, and we've seen and played around with that can really um, help stimulate that phosphorus avail availability or end other yeah. nutrients. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if you've had a look at Lauren Steinledge. Steinledge, have you, did you meet him, Grant, when you went to in yeah. Iowa? <laughs> you know. Uh, I yeah, but I'm, yeah, I know Lauren, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yep. that, that idea of like having a continual living, growing crop that you're, you're planting into. So he's using white clover, for instance, and then, or having cover crop mixes between corn um, and seeing those kind of responses that we are, that those plants are releasing phosphorus. I mean, all of your legumes, except lupins, are. Uh, and lupin's got another role, right? But all those legumes are big fungal feeders in terms of how do we get more fungal diversity in there. Lupins, like your buckwheat, um, have an adventitious root system that releases really powerful acids to break that bond again. So it's why, you know, you will use them in gardens or whatever to do your um, intercropping. But I think the people are really cracking this intercropping or the peolas or you know, having more diversity in that system because those different plants are then re relating to different types of microbiology as well to help release these bound nutrients. So we can really get off the nutrient treadmill. Yeah. Yep. Um, there's a question yep. about putting trace elements with liquid. Oh, saying if you put trace elements with liquid vermicast, you can cut it back 10 to 20%. 
Um, there's actually fulvic and humic acids in liquid vermicast, so they help to increase cell wall permeability. So you could actually not only drop by 30%, you can do more than that. So some, I don't know, Grant, are you making your own trace elements? Uh, yep, 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 yep. yeah. So we're you pardon? You're dropping right, right down? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. So, um, yeah, we, 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 I don't know, for years have sort of had a product that's got all, all trace elements and the main ones, and now we're making our own. But, um, yeah, and, and that's we've seen on our um, SAP tests, you know, back years ago, and we're just on straight map, you would have deficiencies in whatever it may be, copper, zinc, or whatever. Now they're coming more balanced, and I think that all helps with their, you know, um, keeping our uh, bricks level up, you know, keeping disease and insects at bay. And um, so, yeah, I think like when we're over in New Zealand with, with yourself there, Nicole, they're saying, you know, add um, microbes to the minerals, you know, and so, and then humates. So if we, we get that biology in with the, the minerals, everything seems to amplify um, yeah. each other. Yeah. So we're, we're looking at what traditionally might be between one to 10 kilos of a trace element now down to like a hundred grams of a trace element and seeing the same response in the plant um, and brewing that through fulvic acid or, or using compost by making a compost um, extract as such and then adding trace elements into that to get it to chelate um, in a manner that the you know you still have the biological metabolites there um but seeing just massive Im improvements in terms of um, efficiency of those trace elements mm. is there much um is there much known around with the use of um humates and being able to drop and gaining efficiency with the use of it um is there as much um is it as well known around the herbicide use with using fulvix and dropping it or is that a bit more of an experimental area we with the glyphosate shortage here with the um coronavirus we were going as minimal rates as we uh could and we're adding fulvic and yep. we were dropping less than 30 percent for the amount of active constituent to go out and we did not see a kill kill job but is that something where it's not as well known whether the fulvic's um enhance the job of it but you still get the efficacy where is the humates um nutrient wise that's more of a known that if you drop it you add it in add that source that it, it increases the efficiency um yeah the work that was done on that cell wall permeability was on humics um that fulvic yeah is going to increase the efficacy so you're saying you drop by 30 percent or you dropped it, it, it wasn't we, we had as much product as we had on hand. We worked out how much area we we're trying to cover, and then added the full in. And it just happened to be a bit. It wasn't. It was about twenty five percent drop in what we would have used rate wise. Um, yeah. And it just yeah, it wasn't. It well, yeah, it wasn't wasn't enough. We didn't see the similar sort of job. One paddock we did a trial paddock where we didn't put full in, and we had had the recommended rate. And we got a good kill, but where we dropped drop rate, we we didn't get a just good a kill. And so, what was the pH in your tank? You're asking questions. I don't know. Now. It was it was rainwater. It was is out of a rainwater tank. Um, we yeah, have what that actually is. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. So I would I would get a pH meter. All of everyone that's using herbicides or foliars get a pH meter. They're not very expensive, and start to look at. Um, because, you know, a lot of those chemicals are more, you know, the efficacy comes down to, you know, between 3.5 and 4.5, 4.6. Um, and so we're finding, yeah, if you're not getting that pH down and fulvic acid, no, so humic acid's alkaline and fulvic acid's acid. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'd, be, I'd be really curious about that. We're not having that problem. We're putting fulvic acid in and finding good kills, so. We, this year on our knockdowns, we used the product with the full vic of molasses in the glyphosate and we had total, and I think it was like, you know, 1.2 litres a hectare of glyphosate, glyphosate at like 450, a low, you know, a cheaper sort of one. And um, yeah, we had complete brown out in five to seven days, like it's working really good. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, some of these things can help. And I, I know there was a question in there somewhere on, you know, looking at, 
um, when we're growing our monoculture grain crops, I suppose, and there's, you know, ryegrass and things like that and, and, and what chemicals or resid um, herbicides we can use to control that and the, the um, you know, detrimental to soil biology. Um, is, I think if you got that question there, Tom, some, and then whether you could use some of these things to buffer or, or there's better choices or rotations or... Yeah, so um, if we got... Well, for us, our, probably our biggest headache here is ryegrass um, and whether we're better off taking action with a pre-emerge and herbicide to try to get control, but then buffer against those early actions to get crop established. Um, but then what we can do in crop to mitigate against that early practice, whether that's too detrimental early on um, to then... Uh, yeah, remediate some of those early actions, whether we're better off taking the early action and establishing a healthy crop and then in crop replace or yeah, remediating that, that early action. That's our, well, at home here, that's probably our biggest issue is around ryegrass. It's so suppressive. Um, it's takes some hard chemistry to get on top of it. But if we don't, then our crops, you know, it's also how long does it take for our system to evolve where ryegrass isn't an issue and it's not, not so, so competitive, but in the early stages when it is, do we have to take that early action and then, yeah, drive crop performance and inputs to remediate against that early action? Oh, I'd say like on some of that, because I get asked that a lot with, um, you know, using chemicals that on the ryegrass and things like that. At the end of the day, you know, we've got a we we can't be planning into those conditions because you're gonna it's going to be detrimental to to yield and and the outcome. But I suppose you've got to ask yourself some of the 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 things we're doing. Are they creating the environment or the conditions for those ryegrasses to to thrive in? And and you know, we see on some soil types, you know, it'll grow to nearly a line, and it's not you know you put the same chemistry over everything, but it it's you know, maybe looking back at, at um, what's going on, you know, in the soil and, you know, using, changing the, the um, dynamics of the soil so that it's not as favourable as for those plants to, to thrive in, I suppose, um, whether yeah. through rotations or making it more fungal or, or whatever, yeah. We, I just haven't noticed last year, we are still low rainfall year, um, here last year so we didn't have water logging which is usually one of our biggest issues a wet drought is more of an issue than a dry drought here um, and was noticing when you know your paddocks long enough you know where your wet spots are you can nearly walk to them with your eyes closed in a paddock and and land in the spot from the gate um, and last harvest was noticing crop going from yielding to very little and well where ryegrass had become dominant and when we're shifting shifting bins across the paddock, I walked across with a shovel and I'd drop the shovel in where there was healthy crop and there was nice porosity in the soil. Then we, where you'd get into spots where the ryegrass was either completely dominant or there was some crop, but mainly ryegrass, it'd go to a slab of, slab of concrete. Um, so it's in that scenario, the ryegrass is present where, where we've got anaerobic or wet, wet compacted soils is where we're seeing the ryegrass issue. So as we build um, porosity in our soil structure, whether the ryegrass becomes less of an issue, um, just off those observations, but at the moment it's where we're still building our, our porosity in our soil. So it's still a working progress and what actions we can take to sort of keep crop production up whilst we're trying to, trying to build our, um, our soil structure. Do you want to answer some of the questions that we got emailed? Yep, I'll just have a quick run through some of that. If you were to be picking between um, uh, applying biologicals and traces and you had to pick one over the other, would you be going for on seed or in furrow? I'd do both. If you had to pick one or the other? Oh. There's like four 
patterns though, isn't it? Like biological, what trace elements on the seed or in the farrow? It, yeah, if if you were to be, if you had one option or the other, would you be going for on seed with everything, or would you go for in in farrow if you had, if limited by what what equipment you have on hand, on yeah. seed primarily rather than for early stages if you don't have liquid set up for injecting? Yeah, well, I think if you don't have a liquid set up, well, then that's your, sort of your only choice, yeah. really, just to get it on the seed. And at least you've got something close and on the plant. Um, ideally, you do do both, get it some on the seed and then inject some in the furrow. Um, and I think, well, we've used liquid inject for, for a fair while now, and, and um, they're not that... You can set them up yourself pretty you know, pretty easy and, and not too, too de expensive. If you get a lot of your own, you know, make your own, you know, get fittings standard, just out of the standard shops and that it can all be done. But um, I really like it because you have the ability to inject the biology into the soil, um, you know, with the, with the um, other fertilizers, if you still, use, you know, granules or whatever. But um, you can, a lot of the biology you can make yourself and, and put it in there quite, quite easily and cheap as well that has a huge uh payback i think yeah we we don't have the ability at the moment to put liquid on so everything's going straight on seed um like to like to one day get to the liquid inject but at the moment that's we can only go on seed so that's what what we're doing just everything on i suppose on that too nicole if you, if you didn't have the ability to inject it in in the furrow and we put it on the seed then we can also look at coming back as a foliar you know with your yeah. dissolved urea we want to talk about and even some biology and talk about you know um, if we are going to do some foliar you know we can get into sort of some practical tips on dissolving it and adding the humates and things but how important it is to have things in there that if we're putting biology on the leaf that it, it, it you know we put you know whether a fish oil or something a carbon source to help protect the biology and help it stay on the leaf and, and things like that some um and you know times yep. of spraying it um you know how important with herbicides in your tank then to put it in with biology like um decontaminating and, and some of those sort of things yeah go for it oh do you want me <laughs> don't mean it to... <laughs> yeah. like... oh, you're all doing it <laughs> oh <laughs> well that well, that's one on the um, the foliar nutrition, I suppose, and we can look at. I think it's a real good step, and and Joel went through a lot of this, and and Graham does like um on you know being more efficient nutrients, uh, um you know instead of broadcasting you know eighty kilos of urea, we could dissolve fifteen or twenty um, kilos. Oh, you know um we we find a ratio of twenty five percent, so we'd put what's that um every 60 litres of water, there's 15 kilos of urea in it. So if we put it out at 80 litres, it's 20 kilos per hectare. And um, that dissolves even in the middle of our winters um, pretty easily, that, that, that rate ratios in the water. And there's, there's tables you can Google for um, solubility at water temperatures and things. But we're, you know, dissolving the urea, um, adding the humate or the carbon source of humates and then fish and other biologicals putting that on the leaf, we're getting, it's, you know, the efficiency, which you can probably touch on compared to broadcasting, um, you know, we're finding 15 to 20 kilos a hectare. We're getting sort of similar results to 80 kilos broadcast. So there's a huge saving straight away, but also we're finding that the plants, we're lifting the bricks. We measure when it's broadcast, generally the bricks goes down um, and then that opens you up for frost. Um, issues insect diseases you know when we get that more balanced nutrition out with the dissolved urea we're getting uh you know bringing all nutrients up you know sat and we sap test this to check um but then you know i suppose on the frost thing you know even foliaring um you you said the other day nicole with the uh, pseudo pseudomonas syringae and the pseudomonas you know, having the pseudomonas florenzae in the um in the fit in the worm and stuff that helps um, with the frost and whether you want to touch on any of those things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what, what you're doing is really fascinating and I think, um, I often think of foliars as being, you know, we're kind of bypassing the soil processes, but um, we're then enabling that plant to really set up its microbial 
community so that it can actually start enhancing or absorbing those nutrients for themselves. And so um, I think my push for you is to start looking at how, how refined can you get it and how little yeah. do you need because your soil, I mean, when I went to Grant's place, it just amazed me. We had a penetrometer and it was the middle of summer and that penetrometer went to the ground in your field and I've never seen anything like that. Like it just blew my mind. And it's like, if you are able to do that and start to create aggregation and have a soil system that's starting to work, how much of the nitrogen do you actually need and how much of these other inputs do we need? And I think, you know, doing your leaf tissue tests and keeping an eye on that stuff is really important. Um, the frost stuff is fascinating. And I mean, there's multiple things obviously involved in frost. Um, one of them is your bricks. So as we get those um, sugars and dissolved solids up, uh, your water goes down. So there's less water in that leaf. Um, we find um, nitrates have a role. So having um, a nitrate problem in the leaf makes that plant more susceptible to frost. Um, but yeah, there's organisms that create those, those, those frost um, nuclear, nucleuses on the leaf surface is a type of bacteria which you spoke about so beautifully so your pseudomonas um, syringae which is um what makes up about 40 percent of raindrops as well so i mean it's it's in the atmosphere it creates rain and and these nucleuses um, and what eats that is a type of bacteria called pseudomonas florenzins which um is florenzins because it actually does glow in the dark um, but it comes out of a worm's butt. So it's one of the reasons that, another reason why I like worm extract so much is they have this frost eating organism. And so we've used that in viticulture which, with, with just phenomenal results, same in um, avocados. So not only um, you could do as a foliar, but actually as a soil application, that, mic that microbiology will move through the system. You know, It's moving in the xylem if you're putting it on as a foliar. Um, the biology will actually move through that actual plant um, and down out through the root system. So, you know, incredibly beneficial. But how do we really start to have a system that's that's humming? And, you know, if you're doing that seed dressing, that biology will grow as that plant grows up and, and down, you know, the biology is now inoculating all of those surfaces. So, um, yeah, I think there's so much that we can do around frost. That pseudomonas... Um, Florenzins, it will protect a plant down to a minus six degree um, frost event. So, you know, if you're down at minus 10, you know, oh well, <laughs> you're going to see frost. But um, yeah, it's uh, kind yeah. of That's that the one was one two years ago was minus two, isn't it, Nicole? Sorry, Sam. Sorry. I was going to say, I had in my notes that. That was the Pseudomonas florensae protecting down to minus six for up to two months. Yeah, after an application. Yeah. 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 Well, so anything, huge, if you right? if you do put some of that out, will anything um, deactivate it? Yeah. So your yeah. fungicides will deactivate it. Um, it depends. You know, there's there's limited research really on a lot of the impacts of these different chemicals on types of microbiology. Um, and and what's frustrating is we might find, uh, you know, in this case it didn't affect it, and then in this study it did affect it. Um, so I think it's that whole, well, why are we putting a fungicide out on the leaf anyway? Um, you're better yeah. to, have, um, you know, a leaf surface that's totally covered with biology. The same as in our gut systems. You know, we need intact microbiome and if we get a disruption in that that's where we're allowing diseases to come in so um not not using things that are going to be caustic um and that's you know whether trace elements we are buffering those with the fulvics or vermicast or compost or whatever so that we're not getting the biocide effect because you think you know all those trace elements are biocides and if we are going out with a compost at 100 grams um you're really not going to be doing a lot of harm um, if you are mixing these products, you know, like trying to make your own trace elements, then you're going to add that trace element last. So allow, you know, a compost extract to brew up or feed it or whatever and get good biological population. And then we're using sulfate form trace elements, um, the biology like your sulfate forms, but allowing that to mix in through or putting it in dilute so that you're not kind of impacting and killing the microbiology. Because we find um, it doesn't take much to kill your microbes in your tank. Um, 
And then in some ways, you know, uh, we're doing stuff where I know we've killed all the microbes and we're still getting a response because those quorum signaling molecules, the proteins, the metabolites, all of that stuff is still intact. So we yeah. still get a biological response, even though we're putting living biology on. And you mentioned um, uh, a worm product before. That isn't necessarily a living product. What it is, is it's all the proteins and the byproducts of that microbial activity and that's what signals um for the biology in the soil and on the leaf to reproduce um, yeah right. yeah so it's just something to to consider so is it's a the as i said before the foliar stuff's been probably the biggest learning curve for us around what to apply and after a couple of years of soil basic soil tests um and also tissue and sap tests we're starting to see correlations between stuff that is deficient in the soil and is showing up in leaf and other stuff that's deficient in soil that we're seeing inadequate um adequate uh availability in the in the plant and the one that's been standing out for us is calcium where mm -hmm. adequate in calcium in the top 10 zero to, to zero to ten but our ph is a bit low but not too bad but then in our subsoil we're desperately deficient in calcium, but we got really alkaline soil at depth, but it's sodic. And we're yeah. seeing the correlation between the deficiency in calcium at depth and then also showing up in the plants. So that's become something that we just consider that it's going to be an ongoing maintenance program that a bit of calcium is just going to be in our foliar thing, but other stuff, it's just year to year, it's constantly variable as to what's actually showing up deficient or adequate in the plant. Which is kind of interesting because it speaks to your ryegrass uh, conundrum as well. Um, mm. I mean, ryegrass, you probably have a deficiency in sheep or cattle, if I can just park that. But, um, <laughs> you know, calcium, calcium is made available to the plant through fungal activity. And a lot of cropping places we see are very, very deficient in fungi. And, you know, most of the activity that we do on, on farm, I mean, everything that we do in modern agriculture is designed to take fungi out whether or not that's intentional. Um, and so when we're looking at calcium mobility and what's happening with calcium, then it's all about fungi. So what are you doing to dry fungi? How are you feeding them? What are you doing with stubble management, hygiene management? So when you're taking a crop off, are you really looking to feed, um, you know, your fungi and, you know, putting a little bit of calcium on when you actually take a crop off and just try and get that system starting to really hum. Um, you got sodic down there below. There's a question here on um, high aluminium and that, I don't know if that's a case too, but something to kind of have a look at. It's not. Okay. No, aluminium's not, a, not an issue for us. Right. So this, yeah. um, there is that question here on what does high aluminium do? So if, if you suspect that that might be the case, dig up plant roots and just have a look. If you've got very shallow rooting systems that they kind of shear off, um, have you got naked roots? Um, so we're not seeing Rastafarian development. Um, aluminium's going to impact on all of that. But yeah, what aluminium does is really just cooks those root tips. Um, a lot of you guys in Australia have a major problem with aluminium coming through into your finished grain, into your crops that you're growing. It's in your livestock. Um, then it's going to um, impact on other trace elements. And so we're seeing people having difficulties getting um, trace elements through, let's say, into animals because they're being interfered with with high aluminium. So get curious about what's happening with aluminium. And again, all of the stuff that we're talking about is how do we have that massive rhizosheath so those plant roots are able to protect themselves? Because if you have naked, bare roots, you now have basically a hydroponic system that's aluminium is going to come through real fast. Um, and actually, if the world figured out how much aluminium was in some of your products in Australia, you guys might be in some trouble. So I'd get really curious about what's happening with alum aluminium. Yeah. A um, few questions, I suppose, a bit more uh, local to us, Grand, around this, what's happening over summer and what we're doing, whether perennials are part of the system, whether covers loosen, how we're going about keeping biology fed and rainfall moisture use. Um, I suppose for us, as I said before, with the, some of the ryegrass that a wet, a wet drought is more of an issue for us than a dry drought in winter. So for us using moisture over the summer period to dry profile out 
isn't actually isn't actually a problem. It's been a learning curve around establishing in a dry summer, establishing warm season covers, but um, we're continually learning and adapting to it. But what has your observations been? How have you gone about some of the covers? Do you see, have you seen perennials come back or are you focusing on, on what you're putting in an annual, annual warm season plants? Yep. Um, so most of the stuff, we do is with annuals because we're cropping we want it as part of a rotation but we have started doing some perennials as part of the system as well um the whole thing you know because we're in a probably a, a a marginal or lower rainfall environment here and and that summer you know um you know cover crops or whatever is always a sort of a hot topic on conserving moisture and and all that but um i suppose a couple of things on that you know I think it's really important to keep cover. So on some of our paddocks, we'll have 100% strip of stubble. So we make sure we maintain that moisture. And if we are gonna do some cover cropping, it's knowing your goals and what you're trying to achieve in that paddock. If that paddock has a water infiltration issue, issue or things like that, you might use some tap-rooted stuff, but being in, keeping in mind that they are gonna be detrimental. If you, know, if you let them go through to flowering and and full um, seed set, they're gonna get their tap roots down and dry the profile out, which can be a good thing or a negative thing. So it's being mindful of what you do after that. If we are doing that, we will follow it with a multi-species cover crop, but then they seem to be able to um, adapt and grow. If we followed that with a monoculture wheat and we had a dry spring, we're gonna have a, a pretty well a failed crop. But if we, we follow it with a cool, you know, a cool season multi-species, they just seem to work and then we can um, shut them down before seed set um, in the spring and then sort of build moisture again. The other thing we do and look at is, is um, so it's sort of species selection and time of termination. If we use uh, cool season stuff through the summer, they don't have a massive aggressive deep rooted sit, um, root system. So they're not going to be too detrimental to your subsoil moisture. Um, we've done experiments where we've done you know, chemical fallow over the summer versus letting some of these cool season type plants grow and done soil pits on them just prior to cropping and found subsoil moisture the same. But what the big difference was is where we had a chemical fallow in the stubble, we had, if we had some moisture through the summer, biological activity fires up, they want to feed on a carbon source, which is usually on a living root. If that's not there, they start feeding on your, your old root systems of stubble then you, you get that rotten stubble syndrome where when you're trying to sow, especially with a disc or any machine, those stubbles are snapping off at the base and can cause real issues at, at seeding. Um, if we have even just letting the volunteer cereals go for just while there's that little bit of moisture for a couple of weeks before just going out and spraying them, that's enough just to feed the biology and stop that, that stubble getting um, sort of chewed off at the base and can be a big, big help and gain for later on in the year at sowing time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we find, you know, even we've got moisture probes and stuff and you can conserve all that moisture, even under heavy stubbles, the top um, in the dry, you know, our heat and our sun, it's going to evaporate that little bit out of the yeah. top 20, 30 centimeters anyway. So if we're going to get a plant that we may, you can either evaporate it or transpire it with a plant. And that way, at least we can um, feed some biology and feed some livestock too. We, we don't have moisture probes, so actually testing for what moisture we're really using with the covers, we're not quite sure yet, but I haven't seen a crop following a warm season cover not grow and be able to put it down to moisture. But last, uh, when it was it 2018, when we had that 200 mil, that great big summer rainfall event, um, we were doing soil tests down to 50 centimetres at that point. And one of the unintended results we saw from it is anywhere where we had complete ground cover with nothing growing, ground cover with a warm season cover crop growing, bare country with nothing, bare country with warm season, that even down to 50 centimetres, there was two spots across both farms, one that had 250 mil, the other that had 50 mil, that there was moisture right down at the bottom at 50 centimetres. What we don't know is under where we had just cover and nothing growing, whether at 60 centimetres, there was subsoil moisture, or where we had covers below 50 centimetres, whether we drained the profile right out, 
but to say that that was in December, to say that we're conserving that moisture for all that period, um, I'm not quite sure. But for us here, um, with the livestock in the system and when we're trying to build structure and get some porosity into our soils to actually open it up, we're not seeing a massive moisture moisture penalty, but we're being careful on species selection. We're making sure that if we're planting in October, November, December, that we're using millets, um, low, low water use plants, and trying to get as long a season varieties as possible. So it avoids going to, going to seed and starting drawing nutrient up out of the roots into the head. Um, so I think there's a big part around that too, knowing what you're wanting to achieve rather than just saying, I'm going to go plant sunflowers because they look nice in a dry summer and then rub yourself of a heap of moisture. But for us, yeah, it's been, we haven't seen the moisture penalty, but I know some people have, and I suppose that's where working the trick with this whole system is working out what you actually need, what you want to achieve, what's the right time. Is it opportunity rather than every year? But um, it's given us opportunities in a mixed operation too, to continue to feed livestock over over summer. Um, some of the, um, I think, having our observations about what we think is a is a, a water water penalty or what is actually allopathic chemicals or what is actually a biological response, I think, is really good to distinguish because I think we've come out of a mentality of seeing quite. Um, primitive weed pressures um, in very bacterial dominated soil systems and seeing where they're growing and then you'll see less growth where they've been growing in the following season and then blame it on water when actually it is um, it's allopathic um, it is very bacterial dominated and if we shift that towards um, you know more fungal dominated and I think this is for all cash crops um, and then having cover crops that don't have those allelopathic chemicals, then it, it, for me, it started to pull more questions about, it, have we actually been seeing a water penalty or is it something else? Um, you know, and I think to look at Grant's place and see how that water is changing through that profile. And if you don't have that hard pan and that limitation on this is as much water as you're going to get anyway. And now suddenly you have that whole profile opening up from the use of, you know, biologicals and the cover crops, I think, um, we need to start thinking about water, I think, as a bigger picture. Yep. And the yep. other thing with that, I'll add, like, it's great, you know, and we, we have seen, um, we've seen, you know, trialed and experimented and, and we've seen detrimental things and, and had crop uh, failures or not going. We've followed some of these things. So it's all about, you know, it's a good way you learn, but end of the day, if you're trying to conserve your um, subsoil moisture and in the process lose all your topsoil, you gotta ask yourself, you know, well, I think the important thing is to keep cover on. And if we've got no cover and we get these hot, windy summers, um, you know, we yeah. can lose a lot more than subsoil moisture in, in the topsoil. Yeah. Um, the other thing, yeah. like with these C4 plants, like the corns, you know, probably in this area, there's not much, it's predominantly winter type species. And we've found since we started introducing things like corn and sunflowers, and like Tom said, we don't always let them go through to a um, grain fill and to a big plant, but it's just getting their roots in there. Like if you look at a corn plant in your cropping paddocks versus a wheat plant, the root systems are like 10 times. They've got so much more ability to break up the soil and, and create that aggregation, which then is a long-term thing, but also they're more mycorrhizal, a lot of these plants. And, and another way we're getting these into the system is when we're lucky enough like this year to get an early break, we'll sow long season um, wheats or canolas or whatever, but add you know, corn, millet, buckwheat with them. They'll grow for four to six weeks, get do a heap of work in the soil, and then they frost out in the winter and then bang, you've got a winter crop. So these are other ways that we can um, get them in without them being detrimental to our over the summer with our subsoil moisture. We don't have to all plant them in uh, you can plant them now, like in the autumn, and they'll grow four to six weeks, and they can do a huge amount. Yeah, we've we had stuff. Well, we've planted last year in October through till warm season stuff through till February now, and the February stuff was just left overseed. And yeah, the 
the Feb zone stuff when moisture started cooling down, moisture was available has gone absolutely nuts where the stuff that we planted in December was a very patchy germination, but it's still grown. Obviously it had had moisture there, but it sort of moderated its own plant population in that, that paddock where seeding rates are virtually the same to the stuff we planted in, in February. And then the, the February sown stuff, um, won't, won't quite run up to seed. It's going to have the winter kill. We'll have frost options, grazing options. We can, we're going to put some barley into it post lambing. So yeah, so all sorts of options and mixing it up, but you got to keep, we wouldn't have had, if we didn't have the leftover seed, we wouldn't have been planting this stuff in February and we've learned something this year. So I was just keeping on adapting and thinking about it. Um, any more questions? Yeah. I just see one there on how do we shift our soils being more yeah. fungal. Well, that was what, like I said earlier, that um, adding the humates and the fish in the soil are good fungi food source and then and, and then uh, minimising or eliminating the things that are detrimental, um, obviously fungicides and tillage and um, things like that. Uh, plants, like Nicole just said earlier, the legumes, clovers and things really feed into the fungi. How, if, if you're in the early transitions, Nicole, and you still got a lot of physical soil constraints and you're trying to build a fung, fungal population, is it going to be a lot of applying fun, fungal mm -hmm. products to try and increase population, but it's going to be a battle if you've got physical soil constraints? Do you have to sort of, if you get physical structure improved first, is that going to enhance the ability to um, have more fungal dominant soils? It's a chicken and egg. Yeah. Because the reason that you've got poor structure is because you don't have fungi active. Because fungi are what give you that aggregate structure that um, Grant has working so beautifully at his place. And I'm sure you do too. I haven't seen your soil. We're getting um, that slowly. <laughs> um, but you've got to look at what, what are those physical constraints, you know, is it that microbial balance? Is it actually a mineral balance? So is it like high magnesium, high potassium, or is it um, your management? Is it low organic matter? Um, is it just you? Are you the problem? So we look at um, what is causing that constraint. Why, why have you got um, that soil structure issue. Uh, why is fungi not active? And, and typically, you know, when we come into most properties that this is all new and just, you know, running a conventional program, they are very bacterial dominated, have very poor soil aggregate structure. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of go hand in hand in terms of let's feed that fungi, really work on getting them to build aggregates, support the plant so it's really pumping and feeding the fungi and then have a look at uh, is there a major trace element issue maybe you're really low on calcium um what is it that's putting the drag on the system so you've got to really kind of use all your diagnostics on that so you can fast track it so you're not having to feed fungi all the time yeah so so if you were starting from a low base applying some products but making sure you're knowing what else you need to change yeah 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 because there's no point not I mean, I guess it's like human health, you know, we can keep bumbling along and we're diabetic and you want to keep drinking Coke. It's like, you got to <laughs> figure out what is it that, that is the underlying causal factor in this. Um, and that's why I think the foliars and the, the stimulants are great in the transition, but you've got to address your big drags, you know, and actually yeah. nitrogen, I reckon most operations is not a limitation. Nitrogen yeah. is not, it's soil structure. Um, it's poor biologic, it's, it's low um, protozoa and nematodes, so the organisms that are actually helping to cycle. Um, and everyone just reaches for the nitrogen and actually that then inhibits your natural infixing organisms. So getting really curious about stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. Well, I think that's spot on because, you know, you see it's quite easy and I think we should all get out with a shovel and a penetrometer straight after a rainfall event and look at how far that water's infiltrating them. What, what I see a lot on, um, even on no till, but like knife point press wheel paddocks, you get that, that sort of hard pan layer where the water, when it rains, the water sits there like a sheet underwater and it prunes the roots. And then the lack of oxygen, they're saturated, then it looks like you've got a nitrogen deficiency, but really it's a soil structure problem. 
And I think with all these foliars, for them to work really well, we need to get that soil structure right. And I think not forgetting the fundamentals, like we can, we can go for all these type of biological things and foliars and all that. But I think if we get back to the basics of just no till and keeping cover on paddocks, you know, we found when we went from a, a knife point press wheel to a disc seeder, that started to, after three or four years, it really started to improve our, our um, subsoil structure, you know, and allowing just not that one pass with a knife point creating that sort of fine, you know, shattering and breaking up soil and the finer particles to sort of, you know, work down into the subsoil. Um, keeping cover and then, you know, we do control traffic as well just to minimise compaction. And um, I think some some farms that I've seen that that had just do that really well with a disc seeder control traffic and stubble retention, their soil structures are amazing, even without doing all these other things. And once you get that soil structure right, then all these other things start working really fast and, and, and more effectively, I think. Yeah. Totally. What other questions have we got? Any of those other questions, Nicole, that you quickly want to think are topical to run back across? Oh, oh, the ones that we got emailed originally? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the question, and it's been asked a few times, can wheat and lupins be sown together? I don't see why not. <laughs> what do you guys think? Um lupins don't seem to tend to like competition at all like if it's a i suppose that goes both ways when we used to grow lupins if you want it as a companion it's going to do not an awful lot of growth or anything but whether you get the benefit of it breaking up and making a bit of phosphorus available but um non-mycorrhizal yeah i don't know haven't haven't tried it it's we still got a bit of it on hand from when we grew it a couple of years ago we've been putting it in covers but yeah haven't used um, uh, use it as a companion, but don't know. Trial. <laughs> there's there's um, a lot of work on um, through the North America on, um, and I've got some of it here. But um, species, different ones that are planted together, can have a positive effect on each other or a yield increase. And and there is some species planted together are detrimental to each other. Um, I haven't seen as much, I'd love to see some money and, and some research done on that here in Australia, but a lot of that we've got to look at out of North America. And so there is a lot of stuff generally, um, you know, legumes can be good companions. You just got to, uh, and we do a lot with canola and, and wheats and it's just knowing on what you want to be the dominant plant at the finish when you're harvesting. So whether you're trying to take them both through and harvest the two or you, or you bomb one out as just as a, companion you know, flag leaf whatever and then and um you know harvest your main crop but we find adding the, some of these companions have, have got way more benefits than negatives especially you know if uh through the winter they don't even in a low rainfall environment they don't seem to affect yield um they actually sort of help in some ways but then it's just been mindful. I have seen them being uh, detrimental in a, in, when you go into grain fill in the spring with certain species. Um, so it's just knowing that. Like tap-rooted species, um, you probably want them in a dry environment to be your dominant plant coming into spring because they're going to, otherwise they're going to become like a weed if they're in a, in a shallow-rooted species type crop. Something to think about. Yeah. There's a question from the first that the first lot of questions that we got coming through saying, is there at some point when your soil health is functional and, and working that um, you could use, what does it say, that you could use a herbicide or pre-emergent might gain crop performance, but the soil recovery or soil resilience can cope with that shock. So um, a friend of mine's property was studied um, quite in depth um, by New Zealand Ag Research and what they found was um, an application of 2,4-D um, just totally disappeared. So the microbiology, so once you, once you reach a system that's functioning really, really well, the microbiology can break down a lot of, um, a lot of these materials into their component parts. Um, the problem is, is that we don't have this, you know, massively functioning microbial system. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think 
a lot of the um like looking at radiation or petroleum or all sorts of stuff, the, the role of fungi and actually helping to bioremediate or phytoremediate is just massive. So, you know, if we create a system that starts to become really functional, then the resilience or the impact from using occasional um, chemicals, um, you know, and I think that's, that's a pretty good goal because it's not to say that we don't use any of these um, chemicals, it's that we, we don't need to be using these chemicals. And if we do, then you have a system that can recover. Um, yeah. yeah, it's sort of more. something that we sort of battle with here. We're trying, we know, we know the bad or the, the harmful ones and it's where do you find the fine line between in the early throws when we're trying to increase our soil's health to take action to get crop crop establishment or performance but then not be so detrimental and where's that fine fine line it's not it's not so easy to just say cut cut it out or go full soil health but yeah it's one of those things we're sort of working towards that we get there one day that hopefully that their tools available and that the system can can um manage it if if we need to take action yeah, and I think it's keeping that long-term goal and also knowing in the short term there might be things that, that, that maybe aren't ideal, but we're going to have to do to maintain production. Um, although, I mean, I was really curious to see um, a new block that Di and Ian Haggerty had taken on and they just, they were, it was a property that had been using five herbicides, um, multiple fungicides, and they just came in with their worm extracts and that crop, looked terrible and we had like a field day out there and there was some consultants and agronomists and they were all walking around and mumbling and grumbling about oh here's all this disease in here and you really need to apply a fungicide and this is terrible and blah blah um, at the end of that season they still harvested exactly the same as what the neighbors were harvesting without using any of those inputs and so i think for us it's getting um comfortable with the ugly hair stage you know we have to go through that you guys don't understand this but as a girl we understand this you know like you've got to let it grow out and it's not going to be pretty for a little bit and maybe you don't have those fields right next to the road where the neighbors are going to complain about it but allowing that process to go through without feeling like oh gosh i'm going to have to get a fungicide or a pesticide or a herbicide out there and just allow it um, because we see weeds will go through a cyclical phase and they're just there and remediating and maybe the opening soils up or your program has been opening soils up which then releases a lot of bound let's say potassium which is then a signal for your broadleaf weeds and it's a signal for thistles to germinate and i see this often in year two three and four as people's properties can get weedier leave it alone it's actually a sign that that the system's remediating and we just have to, um, there is a bit of that faith and trust in allowing that system to go through it without feeling like, oh gosh, I'm gonna to have to put this chemical on. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where keeping that long-term goal is so important. That's, we, you're saying you don't put it on the road for all the neighbors to see, we, we're on the highway, <laughs> we can't hide anywhere. So everyone's talking about us. Um, oh, well. But yeah, yeah, having that long-term long -term view sort of, occasionally when you got to hang on, when stuff looks a bit ugly, um, or if you're seeing, we've seen a bit more of a change in broadleaf weed pressure than, um, well, we've seen more of it, but you know, what's that telling us? What's it changing? We don't know, but we're just driving towards that end, end goal. So some of the stuff we just got to ride out and see what happens, but then take actions where, where we think it's necessary to make sure that things still fun, like we still have an income. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think some of that, what we've been doing on some of it, We've for years had certain paddocks, whether it be um, highly sodic or soil compaction or different issues, and you're putting all these inputs trying to fix the, the paddock, you know, lime, chicken, whatever, um, manures, different things. Oh, the little ones escaped there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then you're trying to grow these monocultures, uh, you know, wheat will in the cropping rotation, and we're just constantly spending money. And then you've got it. Then when you're with all those inputs to remediate these issues, we, we need to grow these high yields to, to cover it. So some of these now we just drop out the multi species, um, and we find year one, you know, a lot of these you know um, issues start to disappear. But year two we get that compounding effect. Our know, input costs are so much lower, but then the amount of dry matter we can grow with these things because they're a lot more water use efficient, a lot less inputs used, and then getting live weight gains using cattle or sheep or whatever to 
and then put that back into crop. And we've found that a very effective way, low risk, low input, but we can actually get a high return or high output from these using, using the multi species to rehabilitate, I suppose, land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, questions here around if we're to build soil, soil carbon, are we going to get more gains out of growing covers or having plants doing that or applying composts, um, manures? I suppose that also comes down to, is there, if you're just talking strictly one way or the other, is one way going to do more or the other? But then I suppose there's also your system, what you can work with. Like if you've got livestock, is a cover crop a better option than manure if you're straight, comp, uh, straight cropping manures? Yeah, so um, I want you to consider that there's two major soil pathways. One of them is the, I call it the, I'm here for a good time, not a long time honey cycle, which is your compost and your manures and your biochar and any kind of inputs that you're putting on. And it's important, right? So it's respiring, it's changing and fluctuating, it breathes in and breathes out. It's what gets the carbon scientist all upset because it moves a little bit like water. All right, and th those cycles are important. They drive some of plant growth, but really what we need to be focusing on is living growing roots that are pumping carbon deeper down into the soil. And so your job needs to become, how do I support optimal photosynthesis? Make sure that my plants are functioning healthy, have good photosynthetic panels and are pumping carbon deeper down into the soil where it's gonna be much more stable. It's gonna sit there for much longer the time and there's really influencing you know water holding and nutrient availability um so yeah there's kind of two distinct parts to that carbon story i mean they link in together but um trying to put biochar or compost on as carbon projects i just don't think has a long-term view you know yeah. we're really to be focusing on get that part. so in that scenario for the compost or manures you might get the small you get might get the small quick fix of a nutrient some nutrient mm -hmm. nutrition out of it, but the long term carbon stuff is is the plants plant scenario. Yeah, and, and the manures or the compost could help lift your bricks. So it could help drive that carbon deeper down, but it's yeah. not yeah. it's not really your um yeah, and so you might be using it for that purpose. Yeah. As opposed to I'm gonna put carbon on and blah blah blah. Because yeah. most of that is respired by the biology just gonna eat it up. Yeah. Yeah question here I suppose for more so for you and I Simsy around the system how to start where to start I suppose I suppose that's something for someone to well, for every person to work out for themselves I, I don't know how many hours I spent talking to dad and both of us were pulling each other's hair out trying to understand it but took a lot of discussion how we wanted the system to look where we could start with what we had had on hand like for us to do to do this system, we didn't have the planning equipment, so we had to go buy the disc disc seeder. But um, I suppose you want just got to know what your outcomes are, what your limitations are, and that'll dictate how you start, where you start, um, and the actions you take. And be flexible. Don't lock your don't don't lock yourself in. Like have no fear of saying I was wrong, and you got to change, change your course a little bit. Yeah, I think that's important and um, and probably to set down some goals like we do in, in you should do, write them down on paper with, with any area in your, in your life that you're trying to, to, uh, to grow and, and, and progress. So it's no different with the soil. Write down a goal, how you want the structure to be, it's carbon, how you want it to function and look at things to make that happen and, and look at, you know, it takes time because we can't all just go out and buy a disc seeder and a stripper front or whatever, but look at ways that over time when you're, when you're upgrading, you know, um, to, to slowly uh, change your machinery or whatever to, to be able to do these things. I think like the disc seeder and the, and the stripper has been a big one for us. It's had some big improvements on soil structure and moisture retention and things like that. Um, so they're sort of tools that we can use and then on I suppose transitioning on inputs you know I think the seed dressings are one of the easiest one to get rid of and, and, and swap that out you know we can a lot of these things products whether it be a fungicide insecticide we can you know um, 
instead of using something that's designed to kill things like pathogens or insects, we can use biological um, um, inputs that will design to help things grow, make them healthier, make the plants stronger. So instead of just trying to protect it, put it like a sunscreen, you know, like a protectant on the leaf to stop diseases, let's do a biological thing that'll help it, you know, build its own immune system, put a stronger root system down, lift its sugars. Um, on the, you know, we might with the seed dressings, then if you are using math and daps and things like that, I think the carbon, you know, adding that um, to the, to the, to the fertilizer to help buffer and then look at even adding in some guano like blending it in or things that are going to provide that trickle effect and flow on of nutrients in and and, and encourage the, the biology to work not shut it down um like and then eventually like I, I think to transition out of those things and have your soil cycling with the biological stimulants and nutrients is uh, is where we want to get to i think yeah i I think the biggest thing is you've just got to know what set out what you want it to look like. And then pretty quickly you get a priority list, what you do need to change, what you don't, what you got on hand. But yeah, it's not a, it's not a slow process and it's forever, forever evolving. Yeah. Yeah. And for us, for us here, we, yeah, we had to go to the, the disc systems allowed us to establish covers in a very dry moisture limited environment and maintaining the cover but in higher rainfall areas the disc the disc and complete stubble retention and um, residue handling like we got it mightn't be mightn't be the first first point of call that you had to go to but for us the disc opened up more opportunities so that's the first first avenue that we we took we um this year's inter last summer we had a, a fire go through a strip of one of our paddocks in a strip of stubble so I, I mean, nearly it was just sort of your worst nightmare when you see uh, a fire. We weren't even in that paddock harvesting and looked over and saw that going. This year we've got, um, I've sown winter canola in it in the strip of stubble early with um, millet, corn and buckwheat and things like that. But just where that strip of fire went through to the soil that we've had in this system for a long time. So it's it's a nice sort of structure and good cover on it. It's It's unbelievable. Chalk and cheese, the difference in what we've got growing on where the fire went through and where it didn't. So we've got to be mindful of um, some of these things. They can have a huge um, uh, negative effect on our biology and, and function of the soil. It looks like it's been eroded and windswept and it's just terrible really. But um, yeah, off in where we've kept, you know, where it didn't burn and got plenty of stubble, it's like a mulching effect. That soil just gets keeps getting softer and softer. Yeah, and I suppose that's a uh, early, early, um early days throw is you mightn't see you might see a little bit of moisture um moisture benefit or something out of the stubble retention but you mightn't see you know it takes time for that effect to to eventually show up as to what that long-term retention of ground cover means and for you you've had an unintended trial where someone's burnt it and it's like okay well in, we've seen a result in one one hit of what what removing it does yeah. Uh, someone else? point out that there is a chat box that um, we've all been replying into, so you might be curious at seeing what some of the questions have been asked and answered so far. Um, yeah, so that's just on the side. Um, what else is showing up in these Q and A's at the moment? <laughs> have you ever had any disasters to learn from plenty <laughs> um i suppose for for us our biggest learning curve was dropping off the high analysis for it and how how little we could go in a folia um folia program so some of our crops haven't looked fantastic during the year it's been slow we've still harvested reasonable crops, but it's been a learning curve over year, over the couple of years of what we need to bring in, how we need to keep adapting. Um, for us, probably actually ryegrass, some paddocks where we've said, let's go for soil health, take some chemicals, harder chemicals out of the system that would um, control ryegrass more. Um, We've, we've had crops run away where we've just had to turn to livestock to harvest 
income off off that paddock. So yeah, there's been plenty plenty of disasters, but make sure you learn from them. Yeah, I think it's important not just to you got to keep doing what you know works. Um, don't make you go out and do the whole farm and it's the first time you do it. Sometimes these things take a couple of years to, to adapt and to change. So you might want to transition in stages a bit so you, um, so that you can slowly bring things in and, and if something goes wrong, you're not having it go wrong on the whole, the whole, whole farm, but, but no, don't be afraid. And, and, and I suppose that's where this sort of like Vic No-Till and these sort of groups and sort of events really help because if you're going to try something, there's generally someone out there that's done it and, and maybe can share ways to, to help minimise the negative um, experiences, I suppose. And, and that's where I really encourage everyone to get to be a member. Like it's a, you know, to be a member of, of Vic No Till, it's, it's not a huge cost um, when, over the grand scheme of what you do, but the, there's a huge benefit that you can get out of it um, just through the networking and the sharing of, you know, farmers helping farmers. So. Yeah. No one, no one will ever tell you the right way or the wrong way to, to run your farm, but there's always an idea somewhere that, that might, might steer you in a, in a certain direction to improve or, or adapt. Yeah, and I think um, for me, some of our early disasters were, um, you know, going to see one speaker who had an idea and going, oh, I'm just going to do what that speaker's advocating and so we pulled our, you know, fertilizer inputs, um, started making compost teas and they were really good compost teas. Um, but we totally crashed that, that mineral system, ended up with some real phosphate issues, some trace element issues. We had livestock, I mean, just half a dozen die, but that was bad enough for us. Um, and it was just a really steep learning curve. And I think this is where it comes down to, you know, having groups like Victoria No-Till, um, discussion groups that you can share maybe some of that experimentation between each other. Um, because there are, there are minefields in this. And particularly, I think if you're pulling, pulling the rug out too quick and the system hasn't rebooted, um, we can have issues. Yeah. We, oh, for, for us, we got, um, three paddocks that we've set aside, one that's staying in crop rotation where we're continually planting warm season covers in there, some other grazing paddocks where we've just no herbicides, no fertilizers, just seeing what happens with just continual plant growth. And from those paddocks where we're still applying broad principles across the whole farm, we're taking learnings out of each of those paddocks and applying them in different scenarios in different paddocks. So we've got broad scale trials of whole paddocks happening, but then taking learnings out of that and applying it elsewhere on, on farm. Um, there's just seeing the chat here, a question came up around the profit and loss and of insecticides and when it's required. For, for me, all I did was, um, I think GRDC, there's a few locally here in Australia, there's a couple of websites that just basically have thresholds for, for certain pests. And that's where my starting point was when we're looking at reducing insecticides was just going, going on there, finding what industry recommendations were for thresholds. And sometimes I was happy to exceed those threshold numbers because I'd see beneficials present and starting to be, be active, but there's still some industry stuff out there saying these are what we consider um, economic threshold levels. Um, and if you and then find your own comfort level as to how much pressure you're happy to see, um, it's a good starting point. Some of the some of the thresholds that are actually on those websites, you wonder why an agronomist would recommend putting a insecticide out because it's well below threshold levels. So there is information out there as to a profit and loss scenario that you can gauge um, mm. for insecticides. Um, I also want to kind of pull it back to. I remember years ago, a lot of the times the recommendations would come in just to put an insecticide in just because you're going over the pack over, anyway yeah. and it's cheap. Um, mm -hmm. Then, you know, that's kind of a dangerous and a just-in-case sort of thing. Um, you're wiping out all your predators and beneficials and the pests are the pests because they can reproduce rapidly and they, they come back quicker and harder. So, you know, we're, 
early, years ago, we might have just, when we get pressure, it's off the fence lines coming in. So we might have just done one around lap around with the insecticide on a heap of paddocks just to, and then after time, we just um, ditched it all together. But now we will do, you know, we might do a sap test of a plant, see if there's anything really out of whack. And if yeah. it is, you know, generally we we'll, liquid calcium is great because it'll lift sugars. <laughs> And then putting fish and, and humates and different things in, because as you know, Nicole can touch on this, there's like a strong correlation between the higher bricks becomes less um, yeah, desirable for insects. So we just focus on getting that up, you know, through nutrition and biology. And then all those things start, all those symptoms, diseases, insects, or frost, stem frost, all those things just start to disappear. And, to a point where a lot of the time we don't even worry about them anymore, like insects yeah. or diseases. It's just not something that we, we look at, but we just got to make sure, yeah. So whether you want to touch on on importance of getting yeah. the bricks and, you know, um, minerals that are low or nutrition that is out of balance to getting those things, addressing them. Yeah, and so I would get um, not only a refractometer, but a SAP pH meter. Um, and what we find is there's definitely a correlation, obviously, with bricks and with um, pH to insect pressures. So um, if you're seeing that sap drop right down, then using a nutritional spray instead to be the, the deterrent against insects rather than an insecticide. So we've done this on a lot of high value crops. We are actually applying nutritional foliars instead of a, an insecticide. So insects um, can't, can't digest complex amino acids. So if we have nitrates in the system, if we have the, what um, Jerry Bren Brunetti used to call the funny proteins, if you have those kind of floating around in the system, then that's ringing the dinner bell for insects. So how we complex that is with some of these carbon-based products, the humics, the fulvics. Um, I'm a big fan of milk. So using milk powder, for instance, so you've got a bit of calcium, you've got some sugar, um, it'll help complex some of those free nitrogens in the system and actually change um, the pH and the sap of the, of the plant. So using a sap meter can give you some cool information. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, the, um, yeah, milk sort of high, that calcium phosphorus thing in, in that mm. too, you know, a strong component of it, which I think is, uh, you know, obviously good for photosynthesis and sugar production. And, you know, I've done experiments at home tipping uh, milk powder on tomato plants and the, the yield response you get is amazing and the, and the health of the yeah. plant. Um, I was just trying to look at when you're saying the pH is even the pH in the animal's urine and different things like that. Um, and in plants where you want them to be for, for um, to be healthy and disease and things like that. Yeah. So it's super fun and I know quite a few dairy farmers that are using this. So using your um, pH strips to test um, uh, sparples. So you can just buy like these packets of pH strips and you can actually get saliva from those cows. And that saliva should actually be alkaline because you, the rumen um, is a bicarbonate environment. So not, so our, our pH and our, and our mouths should be, you know, between 6.8 to just over alkali. Whereas, um, cattle are around 7.8 to 8.4 and what you find is if those animals start to to get more acidic you start towards acidosis um, using those ph strips can actually give you an early warning before you show clinical signs of mastitis or whatever so that it's quite fun to do um, with the ph in your sap it should be 6.4 of any plant um, and i i was on a vineyard that had a sap ph of three point four in their vineyards in their vines and i said to them do you have fungal problems and he's like no our fungicide program is working really well <laughs> i'm like oh okay oh but we're pulling 15 percent out a year due to virus so you know having a sap ph like that i mean it's nearly battery acid that's running through those plants you've got a major nutritional problem and what he discovered was applying the fungicides drop that pH even more. So the fungicides were actually creating the environment for more fungal diseases and down and down we go. So um, being able to use pH like that to see, oh wow, actually what I'm doing is actually making the problem worse is a valuable tool too. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's, um, I don't know, you can use, I think it's, I want to say. You're right. 
just saying um, with your your bricks and all that, you know, looking in the morning versus at night to see it going up and down, um, you know, before or after you apply a herbicide or any sort of um, foliar or different things to your paddock, it's a, it's a good tool that we can just have in our pocket and, and yep. check. And, and there's ways you can see if your borons, you know, um, potassium, calcium, we can sort of pick up on some of these deficiencies or or whatever in the plant by just using a bricks meter. Um, so, and that, that, that's all been, you know, we've had that in articles in the Vic No-Till magazine. We've done a whole whole section on that. And I think it's just a handy tool we can all have. Yeah. Um, there's a new, another one too that we played around with recently. Remember in New Zealand, they bought the, that biometer? Yeah. Yeah. For a biometer. Um, it kind of gave us a score for, you know, is this poor soil or good soil? I mean, I think this, you can visually see that for yourself. I don't think you need a, a fancy scorecard to tell you that. Dig a hole, you know. Yeah. I don't know. A number, I guess, for people that need numbers. But So your yeah. undies. Yeah. Dig, put your undies in the ground and how quickly do they disappear? <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's going to be lots of we're not going to be able to answer in the next 10 minutes. Yeah. Oh, it's question, no risk of sending a soil anaerobic from using milk. Um, you're not going to be putting that much on. So um, on pasture, we've been using about 40 litres or four gallons. Um, we've used up to 75 litres um, and we have used it in, in viticulture for control of like powdery mildew works really well on a lot of those surface kind of rusts and um those soft these really don't like milk which is quite fun um so no you will send it anaerobic if you're going to pour milk on like these guys that are dumping milk at the moment that's not good we're talking about small amounts yeah Um, do, I remember there were some earlier questions on teas and extracts. Do you want to pros and cons yeah. of any of those? The compost yeah. teas, compost extracts? Yeah, so I used to do commercial compost teas and um, I just found that there's so many more things that can go wrong with a compost tea compared to an extract. Um, you've really got to be very diligent with a lot of like your things like your dissolved oxygen, um, what kind of foods are you feeding? Who are you actually breeding up when you're breeding up a compost tea? Um, a lot of bacteria obviously go nuts in a compost tea, but less so like maybe your fungi or your protozoa or nematodes. Um, so I ended up going right away from compost teas. Now I use slurries. I just love a good slurry. Um, so the slurries are, you're putting on more compost than you would in a tea. Like say in a tea, you might put on half a kilo per hectare. In a slurry, you might put on 20 kilos. Um, but you're basically sending out the house as well as all the metabolites. Um, I think you get better survivability. You just need equipment that can spray a slurry. Um, and then you've got the extracts, which is what Grant's doing. So, you know, blasting uh, using air or water um, to actually extract or take that nutrient off and someone asked the question before about how do you know about your vermicast or worm extract you're looking for color so when grant turns on his machine and it just turns to this beautiful dark chocolate brown that's what you're looking for if you're running water through say compost or vermicast you want to run that water and keep that lovely dark color and then if it started to go paler or it started to go kind of a golden color, then that's when you turn your water off because you've extracted all those humic substances off at that point. Um, so in extract, we're really looking at how do we get all the metabolites off that surface. So lots of water pressure, air pressure, um, depending on the types of equipment that you're using. Um, but I find extract a lot easier in a big commercial system like, like these guys are running. So you can put that through a lot of your gear a lot easier than a slurry. Um, slurry end up putting out a lot more water. I don't know where yeah. Grant, but yeah, did you want to add something, Tom? I was, I was around the brewing process, and I think the Haggerty's like they just feel that's what they fill their sprayer with for their application process, and then to activate it is just adding a worm, worm leachate as it's going in the tank out the paddock. Like that's mass scale, making it as simple as they can for their for their process. So can make it as complicated yeah. or as simple as, as you like the system to be. 
Yeah. And I think we humans like to really overcomplicate things and it's like, no, simple, less is more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And for, for us, the simple like to go and set, set it up mightn't be a costly thing, but at the moment for us, the practical is to be buying off product shelves. Like that's what we found to be an efficient method at, at the moment. And that, that might change. Yeah. Um, am I in? Am yep, I you're back here? in. So the, so the kids just turned on Netflix and I think the internet just overloaded. <laughs> um, but um, what was interesting with the extracts and that, um, after being in New Zealand, I got one of those micro uh, biometers and we had a yep. workshop here uh, just before the corona stuff. And it was actually interesting to test, you know, to use on site um, to see the effectiveness or how we're doing the extracts. And I ran the extractor and we did a test within, you know, 10 minutes and you could even just visually tell the water was quite, you know, hadn't gone that chocolate dark color yet, but we yeah. grabbed it, tested it and it was quite low. But then yeah. we kept running the extractor for, you know, whatever, a couple of hours. And then we tested it again later and the same without doing anything, just giving it more time and it was through the roof. So, um, oh, I think, that, yeah, that would be value. Well. I mean, that would be your value. I would, I would use it for that. That's cool. Yeah. Um, but no, it was handy to, to sort of see uh, that. But and that, I don't know, I dropped out there with you said, but that the extracts can have a more diverse range of microbes because like you said, I think you're touching like the teas, you can sort of, um, you know, that can enhance one specific species, the aerobic ones or whatever, but the, the um, extracts are more diverse, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Less if you if you're doing compost tea you want to be relatively competent with a microscope the amount of people i've met that are making these anaerobic bacterially dominated nastiness in their compost teas and they're not looking at it in the microscope and then applying it and it's like well no wonder you're having more disease problems and uh, loss of soil structure and all sorts of stuff so um you know i think compost teas can be used well with people that really you, you've got to understand a system a lot more than a, a slurry or an extract. Um, yeah. And so not saying that compost teas are bad. I just think you need to know a lot more about what you're doing. Yeah. Mm. We're All right, getting we've got three more minutes. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything else that you think is worth covering or bringing up, Nicole? Just briefly or closing it? been trying to type people's yeah i think maybe if we just sum stuff up um, yeah i suppose from a practical standpoint my comments are that you know it's no know, know what you want to achieve there's knowledge out there about people have tried different things so it's easy to find a bit of knowledge but the the easiest thing to do is to start and know what you want the system to look like and then source the information and techniques how it might work elsewhere but it is a learning curve and to know, know the outcome you want to achieve will go a long way to getting, getting some success and believing in it. If you don't believe in it, not going to happen. No, which I think just comes back to the mindset issue that we have. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Um, and I've seen a lot of people sabotage their success by just thinking it's not going to work anyway. And so they get yeah. their timings wrong they don't check their brews or, um, you know, they just mess about with products or allow stuff to get too hot. You know, like there's so many things that you can do to really, when you're dealing with a living system to kill your, your system. Yeah. And, and I, th I think for, for us, some of the biggest learning has come because we knew what we we're trying to achieve. So if something did work or didn't work, we can, when we, when we didn't get the outcome we wanted, you can analyze it a lot more rather than saying someone said to do this, so I just did it. If you know why you wanted to achieve it, then you can analyze what went wrong and you can improve a lot quicker. Yeah. 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 Um, so we recorded this call, right? So that this will be available to people. First time doing ready. it, but hopefully it's been recorded correctly. <laughs> I recorded on my side just in case there is a problem. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll... Yeah. Dimsy? Oh, no, I was just going to put in my. Um little bit here but yeah just sort of thanks for asking me on here and uh, not what no longer on the board but know what goes into this and I think it's great you guys you know, to have done this you know in these tough times and we can't 
have a, the more you know the the model they've been using with the the workshops and and the um the conferences and and just sort of asking everyone here to keep supporting um you know by being a member support the sponsors you know that that help put this together you know these guys everyone's doing it in different times at the moment so um i know yeah vic no till really values um the contribution to all the sponsors and and the members and um yeah just keep supporting each other and that's how we all can grow um with our saws and and businesses and things like that mm. and then, mm. yeah, yeah really appreciate everyone's questions and participation um it's been a lot of um fun and i think you know um if you're not not sure where to start just just start somewhere small just start with a trial just you know just just do it right don't you know the, the greatest regret i see with people is that they wish they'd done more earlier you know they hear an idea and you sit on it for a few years and it's like just just try something put a little bit of humic in i don't know yep. try a bit yep. of a worm extract um try buffering some of your trace elements or, or whatever start doing testing looking at what's happening with your leaf samples you know your plants actually have an excess of nitrogen because we see that more than not enough nitrogen so you know just start building up your your knowledge base and yeah i really appreciate um all your questions so thanks guys so uh, before oh, i get... read my book <laughs> <laughs> um before we get to close it again uh, this is the first webinar that we've done hopefully it's gone well we've had over 240 people tune in which is unbelievable for the first one um uh, thank you to again thank you to the australian government land care programs wimmera catchment management authority for their support and vic no tills platinum sponsors hybrid ag and lorry co um nicole and grant thanks for taking the time to sit on here and i'm sure we've given people a bit of a headache but also given them some ideas to head down um so thank you for taking the time my pleasure guys no worries. thanks for being Very on good. i'm gonna go right back on. to the snow back thank to you. the snow <laughs> <laughs> see you guys see ya, see ya.